User Accounts. Before users can log on to your computer, they need to have a user account. In an Active Directory domain, users and group accounts are created and controlled from the Active Directory Users and Computers MMC snap-in. So to open this snap-in, we'll click on Start, Administrative Tools, Active Directory Users and Computers. Now although user accounts can be created in any of the default containers, it's best to create a user account in an organizational unit or OU so that ease of managing administration and group policy objects can be fully leveraged. So to create a new user account, we can right click on the OU that we want to create the user account in and we'll select New User. Now take note though you must be a member of the Enterprise Admins, Domain Admins or Account Operators Groups or you must have been delegated administrative permission to create user objects in these containers. If you don't have sufficient permission to create user objects, the new user command won't be available to you. Ok, so the first thing we need to do in creating our user account is to give the new user a name. Now our new user is called Bob Jones, so in the first name field we'll enter in Bob and in the last name field we'll enter in Jones. Now the initials field is entirely optional. Now when we enter in Bob Jones, you'll notice here that the full name is populated with the first name and the surname. Okay, now we need to give Bob Jones a user logon name. And this is also known as a user principal name or UPN. In fact, you'll hear the term user principal name or UPN used quite frequently. So become accustomed to be calling it a UPN. So I'll give Bob a UPN of B Jones. Now you'll note over here on the right that I can't change the DNS name of the domain, but we'll talk a little bit about this later on. Now this UPN can be used to log on to any Windows system that's running Windows 2000, XP or 2003, but this name must be unique within your Active Directory forest. Now the pre-Windows 2000 logon name is used for what's known as down-level clients, which include things like Windows 95, 98, ME and NT. Now this field is required and again it must be unique within your domain. Now once this information is complete, click Next and then we'll be presented with a new dialog box that requires us to enter in a password for Bob's user account. So type in a password for Bob's account and I'm just going to use password as lowercase here. Now by default you'll note that user must change password at next logons checked. Now as obvious as this sounds, this means that the first time that Bob logs on using this account, he's going to have to change his password from the one we've just supplied here. Now this is good not only for security's sake, but it also shifts the responsibility from the administrator back to Bob. Now it's not that us administrators want someone else to blame if Bob's account happens to be compromised or activities occur using Bob's account that are inappropriate for our organisation. It's just a good security practice that the only person that knows the password for Bob's account is Bob himself. Now sure, as an administrator, we can take ownership of Bob's files or reset his password if we need to, but we don't need to know his actual password. Now if that doesn't convince you, consider if Bob notices some confidential documents are missing or have been changed, now he's looking for someone to blame. Now let's see, who else knows his password? Oh, that's you, the administrator. So guess who gets put in front of the Spanish Inquisition first? So for all people involved, and to remain in line with best security practices, make sure that you leave this box checked. Now next we have the user cannot change password box. For a normal user account, it's best to leave this one unchecked. Changing the user password on a regular basis is a good security practice. The most likely reason you'd want to use this field would be for a system account. So let's say that you have a script that updates a database every day at 9 o'clock. Now if the password was set to change every 7 days for example, then every 7 days your script would stop working until you rectified the password and updated the script to use the new password. So in this instance, having a good strong password and selecting the next box so that the password never expires would be a good idea. Again, for a normal user account, leave these two alone. And lastly we have the account is disabled field. So let's say that Bob hasn't started working for us yet and it's Friday today and Bob starts with us on Monday. Now we just want to have everything ready so Bob can log in when he starts. So we're preparing his account now. Now what we should do is create his account then check this box to disable his account so it can't be compromised over the weekend. And then on Monday morning we'll re-enable the account so Bob can use it. Ok, now that's all done so review it, make sure you filled everything in correctly and then click next. 
Now we just get a review screen. It's just a brief summary telling us that when we click finish, Bob Jones will have a new user account. It shows the UPN and also any of the other settings that we specified for his account. So if that's all okay, we can click on finish and Bob's account will be created. Or will it? Now I wanted to show you what would happen if the password didn't meet the new Windows 2003 complexity requirements. By default, you cannot create a user with a password that doesn't meet certain conditions. To understand what these conditions are, we must open our domain security policy. So we'll click on start, administrative tools, and then we'll launch the domain security policy. So to find out what's causing Bob's account creation to error, we need to look at our account policies that are being enforced in our domain. So we'll expand our account policies and we'll choose the password policy. Now all password policies are defined at the domain level. Now over here on the left hand side you'll see the policies itself and on the right hand side we'll see the current policy setting. Now there's six password policies in Windows 2003 by default so let's go and take a closer look at them. Now first we have enforced password history. Now this keeps track of the passwords that we've used in the past and you can see that it's currently set to 24. Now this means that when we finally create Bob's account and later he goes and changes his password to something else, he'll not be able to go back and reuse the same password he had before, not at least until he's cycled through 24 other different passwords. Now the next setting, maximum password age, is currently set at 42 days. So Bob will only be able to use the same password for 42 days until he's forced to change it. Now next we have the minimum password age and this is set to one day. Now this setting works in conjunction with the maximum password age in the sense that it's best practice to have a minimum amount of time before Bob can change his password. Now the reason for this is let's say Bob has his favorite password, all Bob would theoretically have to do once the 42 day limit is up is change his password 24 times and now he can continue to reuse his favorite password. But by having a minimum time of one day here, Bob must at least use the new password for one day before he can change it. So this means that at least for the next 24 days, Bob is going to have to use a new password for at least one day. Now sure, after 24 days he can go back to his old favorite, but he's going to get sick of trying, that's for sure. Now next we have the minimum password length, and that's seven characters. Now our password was password, and that has eight characters, so it can't be this setting that's preventing us from creating Bob's account. Now the next setting is the one that's tripping us up in creating Bob's account. Password must meet complexity requirements. So let's go and take a closer look at complexity requirements. To meet the complexity requirements of Windows 2003 domain security policy, a user's password must not contain all or part of the user's account name, and it must be at least six characters in length. It also must contain characters from three of the following four categories, English uppercase characters A through Z, lowercase characters A through Z, the numbers from 0 to 9, and it must contain a non-alphabetic character. So our password certainly doesn't meet those requirements. Now this password on the other hand does meet requirements. It contains at least one uppercase character as well as a special character and of course one or more lowercase characters. Now this password itself is eight characters in length and this also meets that requirement. Now I will note however that variations on the word password is still not a great password as far as our security is concerned but we're just using this for our own example. So choose something far less crackable for your own benefit. Now before we close down our domain security policy, we'll take a look at the last setting, store passwords using reversible encryption. Now as it sounds, enabling this policy will store passwords using encryption that's reversible. Now if you have older applications that require knowledge of users' passwords for authentication purposes, you would enable this setting. Now storing passwords using reversible encryption is basically the same thing as storing them in plain text, hopeless as far as security is concerned. But this policy will be required if you're using the Challenge Handshake Authentication Protocol through Remote Access or Internet Authentication Services, or if you're using Digest Authentication in IIS. Now the default setting of course is disabled, so unless you have a screaming requirement to enable it, then leave it as it is. Okay, to see what password policies are being applied to our domain, we can simply, I'll close this down first, we can simply go to our domain, right click and select Properties, then we'll come up here to the Group Policy tab. 
And here we can see that our default domain policy is linked to our testdomain.com domain. So we know that those settings that we've just looked at in our domain security policy are being enforced. Okay, so we know that Bob's password isn't complex enough for our domain security policy. So what we'll do is we'll right click, we'll select new, user, and we'll quickly run through Bob's account creation process again. We'll enter in Bob Jones and his UPN of, sorry, B Jones, and we'll hit next. And now we need to enter in a complex password. So we'll do that now and we'll confirm it again. And we'll go back to exactly how we had his settings before and we'll click finish. Okay, success at last. We can see that Bob's account has been created and we can see it here in our users OU. But what's this red X next to his name? Well, if you recall that when we set up Bob's account, we chose to disable it. Well, let's assume that it's Monday morning now and Bob needs to log on to our network. So to enable his account, all we need to do is right click on Bob's user account and select enable account. And we can see that the object Bob Jones has now been enabled. Now Bob is free to log in using the password we've supplied and then he'll be asked to change the password when he first logs on. Okay, now that Bob's account has been created, let's go and take a look at his account to see what other settings he has available. So we'll right click on Bob's account and we'll choose properties. Now you can also double click on Bob's account and it'll bring you to the same place. Okay, this time we've got a lot more information to see about Bob's account. Now you'll instantly notice that we do have a lot of tabs at the top. The default tab is the general tab. And this is where we can put some contact type information about Bob. Now his first name, last name and the display name is already filled in. But we can add in other information such as a description, what office he works in, his telephone number and email address if he has a mail enabled account and of course a web page if we like. Next we have the address tab and this probably speaks for itself. Yes you can add some location information about Bob, where he works and so on. Now the next tab, the account tab, expands on some of the information we gave when we created Bob's account. So here you can see his UPN, his pre-Windows 2000 logon name, and some of the configuration options we supplied when we created his account. Now in the log on hours button, the default is that Bob can log on during any hours of the day or night, and this is indicated by these blue colors. Now there's a key here on the right that tells us whether Bob can log on or off, blue being log on permitted, which you can see is all the time, and of course white being log on denied. So if we wanted to deny Bob the ability to log on at certain hours, we could simply highlight some hours and then choose log on denied. And of course this will change to white. So we can see here that Sunday through to Saturday from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Bob can no longer log on to our network. And we click OK and then we're done. Now on the log on to button, we can restrict which computers Bob is able to log on to. Now the default here is all computers, but let's assume for the moment that Bob's a consultant brought in to work on our web server. Now here we could check the following computers and then supply the name of the computers that we allow Bob to log on to. And configuring this option would disable the ability for Bob to log on to anything else. Now here under our account options you'll recognize the first three that we configured when we created Bob's account. However, if we scroll down, you can see that we do have quite a few more options. Now, we will be discussing these in later videos, but I want to make one thing clear. Any changes made here directly to Bob's user account will override the default domain security policy. Yes, you heard that correctly. So before, when we looked in our domain security policy, we saw store password using reversible encryption. Now, if you recall, I mentioned that this is basically the same as setting his password in plain text. So even if we define this to disabled at the domain security policy and then enable it here for Bob's account, Bob's account will in fact override the default domain security policy only for Bob's account though. But it's important that you understand this will happen. Okay, before moving on, we have the account expires box. Now again, let's assume that Bob is a consultant working on our web server and he's only going to be here for a week. So we could set Bob's account to expire at a certain time. And that certainly gives us more security, especially if we have really bad memories and we're likely to forget to disable his account after he's left. So in situations like this, be sure to use this setting. Now once you've made the appropriate changes to Bob's user account, simply click on OK and then those changes will be applied. OK, that's the process of creating user accounts. Now if we right click again on Bob Jones user account, we have a couple of other options. We can copy his account to a new account name and that's useful if we've already created all the settings and configured his account properly and we need 10 other users to have the same settings as Bob, we could simply copy that to another name. Now we could also add Bob's user account to a group, 
We can disable his account, and we saw the opposite of that when we enabled his account earlier. We can also reset his password if he happens to forget it. We can move him into a new OU, so we can take him from our user's OU and move him into another one if we like. We can open his home page if he has a web page defined under his account properties, and we can also send mail to him if he has a mail enabled account. Now on the all tasks menu, we get basically the same options here, but we also have a resultant set of policy and planning mode and resultant set of policy and logging mode option. Now these are discussed in later videos. So I won't discuss them now, but basically what they do is they let you to simulate what would happen to Bob Jones' user account and his permissions if he was moved to a different location, such as a different organizational unit. Now finally, we can also delete Bob's user account or rename it if we wish. Okay, that's user accounts in a nutshell. Now in our next video on user accounts, we're going to discuss creating and modifying user accounts en masse using automation.